Testing. 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 Still testing. Says offline. Okay, I think we're good. All right. Sure, all of our good. All right, welcome to another Hoopo stream. Um, today we're doing another retro paper. So it seems like some of the streams with some of the older papers are actually popular. So we're gonna go back to ancient history of 2017 and we're gonna read the original attention is all you need paper. So this paper is the basically the paper that introduced transformers which are the underlying kind of architecture that is used in a lot of your favorite deep learning models, especially the really, really big ones um, like ChatGPT and even some of the image uh, models. Diffusion models have kind of become a little bit popular as well, but I think transformers are still the king because of their ability to be used in a variety of different modalities. So this paper has 62,000 citations according to Google Scholar, so this paper is kind of out of control when it comes to uh, citations. Um, and to me, this is one of the uh, classic papers of deep learning uh, during one of the kind of coolest periods of deep learning, the, the kind of late 2010s. <clears throat> so this paper came out of uh, different Google uh, researchers and uh, I guess this guy from University of Toronto. All right, so let's just get right into it here. The dominant sequence transduction models are based on complex recurrent or convolutional networks. So this is basically what the state of the art was at this time, right? Was basically if you're doing language or any kind of sequence, you're using recurrent models. And if you're doing any kind of images, you're using convolutions. The best performing models also connect the encoder and decoder through an attention mechanism. Okay. We propose a new simple network architecture, the transformer. Go, so that's when it was created, based solely on attention mechanisms, dispensing with recurrence and convolutions entirely. Experiments on two machine translation tasks so that show that these models to be superior in quality while being more parallelizable and requiring significantly less time to train. Uh, our model achieves whatever score on BLE is like a language benchmark. Uh, so another translation benchmark. And the original one here that they're using for language tasks, 3.5 days on eight GPUs. So one thing that they don't mention here that will end up being the Achilles heel of transformers is just the uh, memory uh, size. So transformers basically multiply sequence kind of by itself, kind of self-attention operation. And because they do that, the whole area has to be good, which means that as the size of the sequence increases, the overall memory footprint required to perform inference or to train gets really, really big. So that ended up being kind of the Achilles heel of the transformer, but they don't actually mention it here because this is just really the first paper where they just kind of discovered it. Um, this is actually, I guess, this is interesting. I don't remember this part here. Maybe this has been added. Yeah, so it sounds like they actually added it because this ended up being such an important discovery that they wanted to like, it, 
like more nuanced uh, assigned credit. So it sounds like Jacob proposed replacing RNNs with self attention and started the effort. Sheesh with Ilya designed and implemented the first Transformer model and has been crucially involved in every aspect of this work. Noam proposed the scaled dot product attention, multi head attention, and the parameter free position representation and became the other person involved in nearly every detail. So Noam and Ashish were kind of the, the main ones there, I guess. Nikki designed, implemented, tuned, and evaluated countless model variants, variants in our original code base and tensor to tensor. Okay, so Nikki is really the programmer. So Ashish and Noam are, are kind of like the math guys, and then Nikki is the programmer. Lion also experimented with novel model variants, was responsible for our initial code base and efficient inference and visualizations. So this guy here, Lion Jones, another kind of programmer kind of guy. Lucas and Adian spent countless long days designing various parts of implementing tensor to tensor, replacing our earlier code base, greatly improving results and massively accelerating our research. Okay, so then Aiden and Lucas, these other two guys here, also uh, kind of scale coding guys. Okay, so you basically have a team, kind of a mix of math guys, coding guys that came up with this, and no individual person here was uh, is, is responsible for the transformer, right? It's really a team effort from a team of maybe 10 people. That's important to remember because basically whenever every time this paper is cited, right? It's basically cited as Vaswani. It's this guy's last name, first author here. So, you know, that, that can be huge, right? Because it kind of sounds like this guy here and these guys here did just as much work as this guy, but just because his name, I guess, starts with an A, so that's why they put it first. Every single citation, every 62,000 citation in says Vaswani et al. So, Sometimes unfortunate the way it works. Mm. So, a introduction here. Recurrent neural networks, uh, long short-term memory. This is LSTMs, and then gated recurrent neural networks. So these are basically what the state of the art was uh, when this paper got released. These are basically dead at this point nobody really uses these um, recurrence as a concept is still used but like what they're referring to here the OG RNNs aren't really used anymore uh, efforts push the boundaries recurrent models typically factor computation along the symbol positions of the input and the output sequences aligning the positions to step in computation time generate a sequence of hidden states yeah so this is the concept that I think has continued, where basically um, you'll have the network not just output what you want at that current time step, but then output basically some information, some embedding, a vector, and then that vector is used as input to the previous or to the next step, right? Function of the previous state and the input, right? So this is kind of how people introduce uh, time networks like any robotics autonomous vehicle application probably has some kind of hidden state that's getting passed along inherently sequential nature precludes parallelization with training examples and becomes critical at longer sequence lengths memory constraints limit batching induction models in various tasks allowing models dependencies without allowing modeling of dependencies without regard to the distance in the input or output sequences. However, such attention mechanisms are used in conjunction at work. Yeah, so this is kind of an interesting uh this is setting the scene in an interesting way, right? Where there's there they talk about they're starting to talk about recurrent models and in recurrent models you have this hidden state that's basically being passed through and crafted at each step. And in order to reduce the kind of memory footprint of that, one of the things that people started doing was basically adding these attention mechanisms where 
to basically see, okay, well, what part of this hidden state and what part of this input or what part of the previous hidden state are like, is there maybe parts here that are the same or things here that, that if they kind of are pointing to the same thing, we want to amplify that. So that's kind of cool. Like I had gotten this and it seems like the tension mechanisms coming from recurrent neural networks makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and then there you go. This is where the transformer comes from, where they basically say, okay, let's get rid of this hidden state crap and then just do the entire thing, relying entirely on a tension mechanism to draw global dependencies between input and output. And this is how long they trained the original 12 hours on 8 P100s. E100 GPU, what are we dealing with here? So an NVIDIA Tesla P100 is roughly $400 now. So this is actually a really cheap GPU. Granted, it's like five years old at this point. And you can buy a Lambda Blade here, Lambda Labs, which has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight P100s, eight GPUs for roughly $50,000. This is like a server rack that you like put that into big uh, so right when you think of the server room like in the famous show Silicon Valley you have these long kind of cabinet things and then in those cabinets there's a vertical stack of basically these server boxes so this is one little drawer inside this giant cabinet and then inside a data center you might have rows and rows and rows of these cabinets so, yeah, I mean, they say 8 P100 GPUs, and then this here is exactly 8 P100 GPUs. So this is basically the machine that they trained it on. Okay, the goal of reducing sequential computation also forms the, com the foundation of extended neural GPU, ByteNet, and Conf2S. All which use convolutional neural nets as basic building blocks, computing hidden representations in parallel for all input and output. Yeah, this makes it more difficult to learn dependencies between distant positions. So, in the attention mechanism of a transformer, every part of the input and every part of basically, it can pay attention to any other part. So, there's no kind of bias in the design of this architecture that results in certain parts being more likely to pay attention to other certain parts, right? So they kind of paint a picture here where at this point the architectures had these biases where uh, d distant positions were more difficult to learn dependencies. Okay, an effect we counteract with more attention. Self-attention, sometimes called intra-attention, is an attention mechanism relating different positions of a single sequence in order to compute a representation of the sequence. So the, sequ the sequence basically paying attention to itself. Self-attention is actually has been used a couple times. So here they have some references to papers. See what is. We have a 2016 paper, 14 paper. So, self attention itself is not necessarily an entirely new idea here. Intent memory networks are based on recurrent attention mechanisms instead of the sequence aligned recurrence. And have been shown to perform well on simple language question answering. Best of our knowledge, however, the transformer is the first transduction model relying entirely on self-attention to compute representations of its input and output without using sequence-aligned RNNs. So basically, they kept the self-attention that some of these uh, sequence models were doing before, and all they did was just got rid of the RNNs and the convolution. And I think that's basically what this title is alluding to, right, is that 
the kind of more complicated model architectures that people had with recurrent networks and maybe even convolution inside of them and LSTMs and all this like kind of crap inside an LSTM, they were said, hey, actually, let's get rid of all of that. Just only leave the attention part. And it turns out that attention is all you need for that, or all you need to get the results. Most competitive neural sequence transduction models have an encoder-decoder structure. So encoder-decoder, basically you have one model that takes your input and turns it and presses it, right, encodes it into a smaller representation. And then you have a different model that decodes it, so take that small representation and decodes it back into whatever it is, a sentence or something. So encoding and decoding, all you're doing there is basically compressing information and then uncompressing information and that kind of choke point compression is what leads to more uh, efficient representations of that knowledge and that more efficient representation that compressed representation of knowledge is what allows you to kind of interpolate between things i feel like that like all of deep learning is based around the that fact that you can compress information into a lower dimensional space Okay, so the encoder maps an input sequence of symbol representations. Okay, so in this case, right, they're dealing with sentences. That's what this transformer model was originally designed for. So you're going to have a sequence, input sequence of symbols. So x1 to xn. These are going to be word tokens, usually. So a sequence of continuous representations. So this is the compressed version of that right so this is the encoder takes the the actual sentences and compresses it into these little vectors z given z the decoder then generates an output sequence of symbols all right so encoder takes these x's turns them into z's and then the decoder takes those z's and turns them into y's and then basically you want these y's to be as similar to the x's as possible Transformer follows this overall architecture using self-attention and point-wise fully connected layers for both the encoder and decoder, shown in the right halves of figure one. Okay, so this is the figure one. This is the famous uh, architecture diagram for... So, here they're saying in the left and right halves of figure one is the encoder and the decoder. Of your inputs, input embedding, positional encoding. That's not what we're talking about here. I think what it's talking about is this red part here, this input embedding. Or no, actually, this whole thing is the encoder. Okay, so the encoder is composed of a stack of n equals six identical identical layers. So, um. That's uh, this part here. So this NX here refers to the, the stack. So I think what they mean, the, the encoder is this entire thing here. And then the decoder, I guess, is this entire thing here. Each layer has two sublayers, right? So each layer of the encoder, which is this brick here, this gray brick here, has two sublayers, so that's these two parts here. This feed forward and add norm is one layer, and then the multi-head attention and add norm is the first layer. One layer, two layers, and then n total layers of this whole gray brick. The first is a multi-head self-attention mechanism. Okay, so this orange one here. The second is a simple position-wise fully connected feed forward network. Okay, so this blue one here. So this feed forward, this is just going to be your standard kind of multi-layer perceptron, whatever you want to call it, fully connected neural net, basically just a bunch of neurons followed by a bunch of neurons all connected with each
Awesome, man. Where did they say that? Is that earlier on? Sorry, I don't really, I'm not checking the chat, so you might have said that way earlier and I just missed it. Um, okay, so we were here. So we have the two parts here. They have the multi-head attention and then they have the feed forward layer. All right, then we employ a residual connection, right? That's this part here. It goes around. So this little arrow here, I might have to make my like mouse bigger. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse at all. But basically there's a there's a little arrow that goes around the multi-head attention and goes back where it feeds up and that's the residual connections, right? So followed by a layer normalization. I think that's what these are. So this like kind of like yellow greenish color is the layer norm. Okay, so the output of each sublayer is layer norm of x plus sublayer x. Okay. Where sublayer x is the function implemented in by the sublayer itself. Okay. So x is basically here, right before you go into this multi-head attention, and you're gonna basically feed it past the multi-head attention, and then you're gonna have the sublayer, which in, is gonna be either the multi-head attention or the feed forward. So you're basically taking the input and then you're passing it around, which is this residual connection, or you're going through the multi-head or the feed forward, and then you're basically combining those two and then layer norming that whole thing. So to facilitate these residual connections, all sublayers in the model, as well as the embedding layers, produce outputs of dimension D, 512. Okay. Uh, decoder okay so that was the encoder which i think is this part here and then the decoder i guess is this gray brick here and you're also going to have six of these hi i don't get the part of the three one section okay uh Okay, you're talking about this. Let, let's let's get to it, and then and then we'll see if I can maybe help. In addition to the two sublayers in each decoder layer, the decoder inserts a third sublayer. Okay, so in the encoder, right, we have two sublayers. We have the feed forward and the multi head. In the decoder here, we have three sublayers. We have the feed forward. We have the same one multi head, and then we have a masked multi head. So basically, you have an extra one here, which is the masked multi head. Okay, which performs multi-head attention over the output of the encoder stack. Uh, okay, so this is the encoder stack and it outputs here. So you can see that there's a little arrow here and the output of the encoder actually gets fed into this multi-head attention here. Similar to the encoder, we employ residual connections around each of the sublayers followed by layer normalization. Okay, so there you have the same thing where for each one of these little sublayers, you have a residual connection that goes around it and bypasses it. So you're always giving the residual connections really the reason people add them is because they allow the gradients to go through. Like every time the gradient has to go through a layer, such as a, a FFN or a multi-head attention or something like that, it's gonna get smaller, smaller smaller and you get this like vanishing gradient problem so residual connections allow the gradient to flow past layers and and retain kind of their original strength so that's usually why people add these uh, residual connections but there's also other things like they allow higher layers of the network to understand uh, or to basically receive lower lower layer outputs which means that they can kind of deal with different levels of kind of abstraction Okay, we also modify the self-attention sublayer in the decoder stack to prevent positions from attending to subsequent positions. This masking combined with the fact or offset. Okay, so Piotr, I think what they what they mean here is 
uh, we modify the self-attention to prevent positions from attending to subsequent positions. So the difference between this multi-head attention and this masked multi-head attention is that the multi-head attention here, every part of the input can attend part of the input. But the, the key difference here with the masking is that prevent positions from attending to subsequent positions. So rather than having this four by four uh, array where every single element of this four by four is filled, they're going to mask. So the first two elements of the sequence can only pay attention to the first two next elements. First, or in the third one, uh, element of the sequence, only pay up, up to the third element of the sequence. So basically you're preventing uh, elements that are later in the sequence, right? Positions later in the sequence, right? Position here just refers to the x1, x2, all the way to xn. So that's the position that they're referring to there. And they're saying you can't pay attention to anything that's further than you, right? So x1 can only pay attention to up to x1. x2 can only pay attention to up to x2. I think that's what they mean here by masking. Yeah. This masking combined with the fact that the output embeddings are offset by one position ensures that the predictions for position I can only depend on the known outputs at position less than. I feel like the, there should be like a picture of this. Like I'm looking for a picture of a matrix with masking. Can't find the picture. Let's see if we masked tension. Yeah, this is what I'm looking for. Uh, so it's this. So you see this? Here, actually, this is an even better picture, right? So you have your input on one side, and it's paying attention to itself, right? You're multiplying it basically with itself. Back to this picture, right? And if you have no masking, every part of the input can pay attention to every other part of the input, right? Every X1 can pay attention to anything. But when you have this mask, right, This what this mask does is it basically says X1 can only pay attention to X1. It can't pay attention to X2, it can't pay attention to X3, it can't pay attention to X4, and so on. So basically you're, you're preventing it from looking ahead. Hopefully that answers the question. Not, I'm sorry. Okay. So that's the basic transformer there. You you have uh, this part here, which is an encoder. This part here, which is a decoder. Uh, these positional encodings, uh, these are basically just sines and cosines that tell you where within the sequence it is. Um, and then linear, softmax. This is just like kind of a a generic uh, classification kind of head, right? Because ultimately, these the way these transformers are used in this paper is is for language tasks, and usually in language tasks, you're just kind of predicting the next sequence in the token, or the next sequence. So it's like next word. So here, you would have all possible words that can follow this sequence of words and then you want to output some probability over that all those possible words and say what is the most likely word out of all the words that i have which one is the most likely to be outputted here <laughs> i appreciate it man i can i can definitely try you know i'm not i'm not as smart as these guys like these guys obviously there's a different level of intelligence required to to like design these things and then understand these things. I'm just at the like I can understand what the symbols mean and I can read it out loud and I can tell myself that I kind of understand what's going on, but the level of understanding you need to like think of this originally is is extremely tense, you know. <laughs> Attention functions can be described as mapping a query and a key set of key value pairs to an output. So this is 
key queried some values are all vectors. This is the, if you, if you want to show that you understand transformers, you need to, this is kind of the keywords here. So query, keys, and values, right? If you're ever asked about transformers in an interview or something, you're applying for a machine learning position, like you need to know what these are, the query, keys, and values. So the output is computed as a weight of some of the values where each weight assigned to the value is computed by a compatibility function of the query with the corresponding keys. Okay. So there's gonna be a, yeah, here you go. So this is the query here, the key, the value. So you're multiplying the queries and the keys. So whenever I do this little hand thing and I talk about this matrix and you're this, that's what each side is there, right? So queries and the keys, dot product, right? Because you're basically just multiplying each element with each element. Scale, I don't know what the scale refers to. Let's see. Then the mask, which is optional here, OPT optional. So in here, you're going to have the mask, right? Mask multi-head attention, you'll have that mask. If you don't have the mask, it's just multi-head attention. So that's what this mask OPT, this pink box here is. It's basically saying that sometimes you have the mask here, sometimes you don't have the mask. Soft max, all that soft max does is it just makes your stuff nice. So, um. Yeah, this is what softmax does. So softmax, you give it a number between negative infinity and infinity, and it'll make it nice. It'll make it in between zero and one. So this is a good example, right? Let's say you have this matrix and you have everything from eight, four, two, one, like all these numbers are, there's really big numbers here. There's really potentially really small numbers. And what softmax lets you do is convert them all between zero and one, right? So softmax basically takes uh, what's going to come out of here, what's going to come out of this matrix multiplication and this scaling. And there's a potential that you have huge numbers here and really small numbers and the numbers are going to be kind of gross. So the soft max allows you to make those all zero, like more normal numbers, right? Between zero and one, which are more manageable and they're not going to like explode your gradients or mess up your training. And then you have another matrix multiplication here between the, the keys or between the output of the query and the keys and then the values. Okay. So that's kind of the atomic unit of attention. So that's the scale dot product attention. But then the multi-head part of that, right, comes from doing that with kind of a depth, right? So the way that I think about this in my head, right, it's like when you have convolutions, right, you have the actual little feature map that's like convolving on the image and you have some idea of like little things convolving. But in reality, the little 2D thing that's convolving actually has depth to it, right? There's like depth to it. And multi-head attention is the same way. It's basically, hey, this is what's happening here with the queries, the keys and the values, but there's actually H of these at simultaneously. So there's like a depth to this, right? Okay, so here we're gonna go into the actual math definition of what this scale dot product attention is. So you have keys with dimension DK. I think green is the color that we do for math. Uh, values with dimension DV. So this is the dimensionality of these vectors here. We compute the dot products of the queries with all the keys and divide each by square root of DK which is just the dimension of the keys, and apply a softmax function to obtain the weights on the values. Okay, so that's here. At the end of this paragraph here, we're basically here. In practice, we compute the attention function of a, on a set of queries simultaneously, packed together into a matrix Q. Yeah, so this is the, the multi-head part of it, right, where basically this operation is cute and it's like kind of one 
one deep has a depth of kind of one, but the whole point of GPUs is that you can do big matrix multiplies, right? So like the same reason that you do a batch of training data at once, they're saying, hey, let's let's do a batch of basically these attention, this little scale dot product attention at the same time. So rather than one query, we're gonna have a set of queries and we're gonna do them all at the same time. And so each query has a dimension DK, but then we're gonna have this matrix of queries, U. E's and the values are also packed together into matrices K and V. We compute outputs as attention Q, Q K, V equals softmax. Okay, so you also have the key and the values are also into matrices, right? So you're also just kind of putting a bunch of them into the same one. And here what they're saying is that the attention function, which is basically this entire thing here, right? So all these little uh, squares or little little things here, not squares, what are the rectangles? You can think, you can just replace all of these with, a, with just in your head a function. So basically this is approximating some function which takes as inputs V, K, and Q, and then outputs, Let's see what it outputs. <laughs> Okay, softmax, so this is just the softmax here, right? So all that's doing is it's just basically making the numbers nice. Uh, you have the matrix multiply between the queries and the keys, so that's this matrix multiply here, Q and K. That's all this, all this means here. The little, the capital T here, that's just transpose, right? If you wanna multiply two matrices together, you have to basically take the transpose of one of them in order to work out. You're dividing over DK, which I think is just basically uh, because your sequences are gonna be different length, you basically wanna normalize it based on the length of that. So that's what the dimension, that's why you're dividing by the square root of DK, I think. And then here you have another matrix multiply. So the V here, it's multiplying this whole thing here the whole softmax, when all that means is basically you're you're outputting the uh, you're multiplying the v matrix multiplying the v with the output of that. So that's what's happening here, right? The softmax of the matrix multiply of q and k is being matrix multiplied with v. So that's what's happening here in this equation. Well, again, as well, the softmax of the matrix multiply between q and k is being matrix multiplied with v. Okay, so the two most commonly used attention functions are additive attention and dot product attention. Dot product attention is identical to our algorithm except for the scaling factor of 1 over d k. Okay, so that's uh, this uh, yellow scale box, that's actually what the divide by d k is. Additive attention computes the compatibility function using a feedforward network with a single hidden layer. While the two are similar in theoretically complex in theoretical complexity, dot product attention is much faster and more space efficient in practice, since it can be implemented using highly optimized matrix multiplication code. Okay, so basically they're letting you know that there's actually other ways to produce this attention mechanism and the reason they're using these matrix multiplies is because gpus are good at matrix multiply so it's always important to remember that when people design these different parts of a neural net they're not designing them from what makes the most sense for the math they're a lot of times designing in terms of what is actually the fastest thing we can run on a gpu right so they're saying that here, the reason they chose this dot product and this matrix multiply is because that's actually what's the fastest thing you can do. Well, for small values of DK, the two mechanisms perform similarly. Additive attention outperforms dot product attention without scaling for larger values of DK. We suspect that for large values of DK, the dot products grow large in magnitude pushing the softmax function into regions where it has extremely small gradients. Okay. 
So if we remember our uh, softmax, right? If you have a very uh, big value or a very small value, let me get a better vision of this one. I like this one. Okay, so if you have a very, very big value like infinity or a very, very small value like negative infinity, right? The, the number is going to be very, very, very close to zero. So that's what they're saying here, where if, if the, you have really, really big numbers and really, really small numbers, the softmax function becomes like 0 0.9999999 or like 0 0.0000001. And then at that point, your gradients kind of like die, right? So like when you're pushing gradients through here, right? It'll just kind of get lost in one of these. One of these, like, there's n of these in a row, right? There's n of these whole bricks repeated. So, like, all it takes is just a couple of those in a row where the gradient gets multiplied by 0 0.00001, and then it gets multiplied again by 0 0.0001, and then you very quickly get to a point where the weights and the values of those weights that you're updating in your little neurons, you're only adding, like, you're taking the current value of the weight, and then you're adding 0.00001. 0001 and that's going to take forever to train if you can only add that little tiny gradient to it okay section 3.2.2 here multi-head attention instead of performing a single attention function with d model dimensional keys values and queries we found it beneficial to linearly project the query keys and values h times with different learned linear projections okay This is the key part here. We found it beneficial to linearly project the queries. So, h times. So linear projection is just basically these layers here. It's these little uh, rectangles here that say linear on them, and all your that's just basically saying, hey, you have something with ha which has some dimension. Let's just say ten, and we're gonna basically map that with a little neural net, right? A little projection into two dimensions. And in this case, it's H. See if there's a cool picture for... Near projection for dimensionality reduction. So this is PCA here. But yeah, here, here's maybe, I think maybe this picture shows you. So in this picture, right, you have these red dots, which are the actual data, and the actual data is two-dimensional, right? It has some x2 value and then, or some y value and some x value. So you can linearly project this into a one dimension, which is this line here. And you're saying, okay, this point here, which has some y and some x, we're gonna project it onto this line, and now we can just describe it with a single number, which is basically what is the position on this line. So we took what was two dimensional data, these red dots, and converted it into one dimensional data, which is these green dots, right? So that's basically what they're doing here, is they're saying these queries, keys, and values, they have some dimension, and we're going to actually linearly project it into usually a smaller dimension so that it's easier or faster to compute, right? Like it's just less dimensions to deal with. On each of these projected versions of queries, keys, and values, we then perform the attention function in parallel, yielding dv dimensional output values. These are concatenated and once again projected resulting in the final values as depicted in figure two. Okay, so basically they keep taking all these intermediate uh, points here and then just projecting it back down to reduce the dimensionality. I kind of wish we had a uh, The size. Okay, so actually they do give us the size here. So H is 8. So that is the 
size here. Okay, so h times means there's eight linear projections layer, but h is also the number of the uh, scale dot product attention. So it's like the depth that I was talking about. Like how many of these are you doing depth wise? Maybe it's confusing when I say depth because there's also the depth of the, like this depth, right? The like actual depth when you actually go layer by layer, but I'm talking about the depth and kind of the, into the paper, right? So the thing with tensors is that we run out of human words to describe the dimensions of the tensor, right? You have, in a, in a 1D tensor, you just have length. In a 2D tensor, you have height and width. In a 3D tensor, you have height, width, and depth. In a 4D tensor, what do you describe? What, what is that fourth dimension, right? You have height, width, depth, and then depth again, right? So maybe like a point there on just, we need more words to describe what the additional dimensions in higher and higher dimensional tensors are. Multi-head attention allows the model to jointly attend to information from different representation subspaces, subspaces at different positions. With a single attention head, averaging inhibits this. What does this mean? Jointly attend to information from different representation subspaces at different positions. So, multi-head of QKV, okay, equals the concatenation of all these heads with some weight matrix here, W-O, right? So W-O is this. It has dimensionality, right? This this little E, like weird symbol here, that just means this, like basically it's telling you the dimensionality of this. So this is H times D sub V, which, which is the dimensionality of the vectors, times H, which is the depth, right? So this H here, the depth of that, d sub v, which is the dimensionality of the uh, the values, so here, and then cross, right, like a cross product, d model, which is the dimensionality of the model, which I think they said is 512 up here. d model equals 512. So that's the dimensionality of this weight matrix here that is dealing with all the heads. So basically there's there's a weight matrix that here that deals with all the heads, but then there's individual little weight matrices for the queries, so this matrix here, the keys, so this matrix here, and then the values. So you have a total of four different weight matrices here that you're updating. You have the the kind of the one that deals with all of them here at the end, that's basically the, the concatenation part. So that's this part here, right? This linear here. And then you have the three weight matrices that represent these three bricks here. The one that's only looking at the linear, only looking at the values, only looking at the keys, and only looking at the queries. So those are really the three uh, matrices of weights that you're updating over time, right? As you're training this model, you're pushing gradients into these three weight matrices. So these are the parameter matrices, right? Which is basically just your actual neural net that changes over time. For each of these, we use D key. Dimensionality of the keys is the same as the dimensionality of the vector values, which is the same as the dimensionality of the model over H, which is 64. So it's a little confusing because they constantly say, they like kind of are very particular about uh, having different uh, symbols here for the dimensionality of these different query keys and values, DK, uh, 
think there's actually a typo here. This should be DQ, DK, DV. But here they have DK, DK, DV. But at the end of the day, these are the same, right? They're telling you DK is DV. These are the same. We're going to basically make them the same dimension anyway. So like you don't need to worry about DV and DK because they're the same anyways. Okay. So we got through that and Yeah, I think this is like the hairiest part of this paper is is like this math. And I think even Yeah. H So I think the important thing here is like you look at this and, and you can understand kind of how what the math is doing. But the level that I don't really fully understand is like how did they even think of this, right? So if we go actually go back to the very beginning of the paper here, right? Like this guy here. No one proposed the scaled dot product attention, multi-head attention, and parameter-free position representation. Right? So, how did he think of that? Right? Like, you know, it's very, it's kind of like the once you know the answer, you can look and say, okay, well, that kind of makes sense. You're basically just multiplying these things. You have this attention mechanism. You have these weight matrices. You have some depth H. But going from nothing into that is kind of the weird part. Right? That's That's, to me, like kind of the moment of like how the how the hell did this guy like think of this beforehand and the reality of that is that he was probably already thinking about it right there was other kind of architectures other kind of uh attention mechanisms in previous sequence models that were kind of similar to this and like so all he did was just take what he already had in mind and just kind of like extrapolate one point further but in these papers it kind of seems like he they they came up with this kind of randomly from nothing but the reality is that everything that they're doing here is basically just one little gradient step away from something that somebody else did before in a no Okay, the transformer uses multi-head attention in three different ways. The encoder, decoder, attention layers. The queries come from the previous decoder layer, and the memory and key values come from the output of the decoder. Okay, so this is important here. So, the queries come from the previous decoder layer, and the memory keys and values come from the output of the encoder. This allows every position in the decoder to attend over all positions in the input sequence. This mimics the typical encoder-decoder attention mechanisms in sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. Okay. So... You see here how there's three arrows that feed into this multi-head attention, right? There's two that are coming from this encoder, and then one that's coming from the decoder. And... They're saying the queries come from the decoder and the keys and values come from the encoder. So the queries come from the decoder, this Q, and then the keys and values, the K and the V, come from the encoder. So you're multiplying the output of the, the, the decoder with the encoder, the outputs of both of those, feeding it through all this crap, and then multiplying it again with the output from the encoder. So the keys and the values, right, K and V, are the same thing here, right? That's why DK equals DV, and uh, keys and values come from this. So it's basically like the K and V are both coming from the same. They're basically encoded, and the Q is the decoded, right? Encoder contains self-attention layers, and a self-attention layer of all the keys, values, and queries come from the same place. Yeah. So, 
here with the, for example, inside the, the multi-head attention here that's inside the encoder or the masked multi-head multi -head attention that's here inside the decoder, you see that the three arrows that go into it all come from the same place, right? They're all basically the same arrow. So it's only here in the middle layer of the decoder where the multi-head attention is receiving uh, queries, keys, and values that are from separate places, right? In most of these multi-head attentions, it's kind of receiving the same thing three times. But here is where you're actually getting some stuff from the encoder and then some stuff, some stuff from the decoder. Sorry I keep scrolling. That scrolling is... Okay, self-attention layers in the decoder allow each position in the decoder to attend to all positions in the decoder up to and including that position. We need to prevent leftward information flow in the decoder to preserve autoregressive property. We implement this inside of the scale dot product attention by masking out all the values. So here, here's an even better definition of uh, the masking uh, Piotr right here. So the masking out is basically this is the this is the act. This, so what we were talking about, where you can only pay attention to what you have seen so far, right? The reason they're doing that is to prevent information flow in the decoder. And the way that they're doing that is basically by just setting everything to negative infinity, right? And because this is going through a softmax, right? Negative infinity just means zero. Negative infinity go through a softmax results in zero. Okay, position-wise, feed-wise, feed-forward networks. So in addition to the sublayers, each of the layers in our encoder and decoder contains a fully connected feed-forward ne network, which is applied to each position separately and identically. This consists of two linear transformations with a ReLU activation in between. So feed forward network of X is, uh, this is a ReLU here. So a ReLU for the bajillionth time, right? A ReLU basically just takes your input. And then if your input is above zero, it'll just return that. So if your input is two, it'll give you back two. If your input is five, it'll give you back five. But if your input is negative two, it'll give you zero. And if your input is negative five, it'll give you zero. So Another way of, like, a one way of writing down a ReLU is basically this, right? It's just the maximum of either zero or whatever the input to that is, right? This X of weight one plus B one. So this is the, the linear projection here. Uh, and there's two of these. So there's two in a row. So you basically take the first one and then you feed it into the second one here. The linear transformations are the same across different positions. They use different parameters from layer to layer. Another way of describing this is as two convolutions with a kernel size one. I think this is kind of just more confusing <laughs> way of describing it. The dimensionality of the input and output is 512, and the inner layer has a dimensionality of 2048. Similarly to other sequence transduction models, we use learn embeddings to convert the input tokens and output tokens into a dimension of vectors of dimension D model. Yeah, so, right, whenever you're dealing with sentences, you're not actually feeding in the words and the letters, right? What you're doing is you're using basically a tokenizer, which is basically just a neural net that, that takes words and chunks of words and turns them into these vectors. And it's those vectors are all uh, points on this kind of learned space of all words, right? And the nice thing about that is that every point in that learned space has the same dimensionality. So you can transform a sentence, which is going to have a bunch of different words that have different lengths, into a sequence of to word tokens where every token in that in that sequence has exactly the same dimension and maps to some point on the same, uh, in the in the same uh, space. Uh. 
And then we also use the usual learned linear transformation and softmax function to convert the decoder output to predicted next token probabilities. So that's the part here. So this linear here and then the softmax here and then the output probabilities here, this is just kind of your generic, generic uh, head. So make a little no. generic classification head. You know what I should just do? I should just uh, duplicate. And then I should do this. So that I can just very quickly do this. How about that, you see? So I can just talk and then if I wanna go back to the picture, I do that. Okay, in our model, we share the same weight matrix between the two embedding layers and the pre-softmax linear transformation. In the embedding layers, we multiply those weights by square root of D model. So this is the scaling. Okay, positional encoding. So this part here, right? This positional encoding that is taking your input embedding and then adding the positional encoding. And why does it look like a yin-yang symbol? It's actually not a yin, yin and yang symbol. It's basically a sine. It's, it's supposed to kind of look like a little cosine or a sine function. We must inject some information about the relative or absolute position of the tokens in the sequence, right? So where in the sequence is this token? There are many choices for positional encoding. Uh, in this work, we use sine and cosine functions of different frequencies. Uh, pose is the position and I is the dimension. So. If you have a sentence that has 100 tokens in it, right? The pose is going to be the position of the actual token. So maybe the third token, three. And then I is going to be how many total tokens? So 1,000, right? So in that case, the position and the dimension of that. And the reason you're doing this is because different sentences, different sequences are going to have different lengths, right? So you need some way of representing the position of a token in a sequence that is generic to the length of the sequence. And there's also there's also different things that that make the sine and the cosine nice for this, but ultimately that's what this whole positional encoding is doing. Is it's basically allowing uh the model here to have some notion of like is this token at the very end of the sequence or is it at the very beginning of the sequence? Uh, the wavelengths form a geometric progression from 2 pi to 1,000 times, 10,000 times 2 pi. We chose this function because we hypothesize it would allow the model to easily learn to attend by relative positions since any, since for any fixed offset k, pe pose plus k can be represented as a linear function of pose. Okay, maybe, I don't know. I don't understand enough to really know what they mean by that. We also experimented with using learned positional embeddings. So ra learned positional embeddings means rather than just kind of arbitrarily choosing this uh, sine and cosine function here, you're actually going to approximate the this positional embedding function with a neural net and then learn it over time. Um, Interesting, they found that the two versions produce nearly identical results, which means that when they try to, when they approximated this positional embedding function with a neural net and instead learned it over time, what the neural net learned is basically effectively a sine and a cosine, which kind of is like a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful result, right? Because it kind of shows you that there's like some, some order to the universe in, that sine and cosine represent something deeper. We chose the sinusoidal version because it may allow the model to extrapolate to sequence lengths longer than the ones encode, encountered during training. Okay. 
We're almost there. We're past the uh, position embedding, and now we're into section four, why self-attention. In this section, we compare various aspects of the self-attention layers to the recurrent and convolutional layers commonly used for mapping one variable length sequence of symbol representations to another sequence of equal length. So where each uh, token here is of dimensionality D, sorry, this is green, such as a hidden layer in a typical sequence transduction encoder or decoder. Desiderata. This is interesting. What is this word? That's an archaic like. <laughs> They're referencing a 1920 or 1970s poem? What the fuck? Okay. Uh, one is the total computational complexity. Another is the amount of computation. Okay, so three different things here that they're kind of using to motivate the self-attention here. Uh, amount of computation that can be parallelized. And then the path length between long-range dependencies in the network. Okay. Learning long-range dependencies is a key challenge. One key factor affecting the ability is the length of the paths forward and backward signals have to traverse in the network. Yeah, so this is where the residual connections are key, right? Where it reduces the path that signals have to go. Self-attention connects all positions with a constant number of sequentially executed, whereas recurrent layers requires O of N sequential operations. Self-attention layers are faster than recurrent layers when the sequence length N is smaller than the representation dimensionality D, which is most often the case. Okay, so the sequence length N is basically uh, the size of the sentence, right? And then the representation dimensionality D is the dimension of the word vectors or the tokens. So they're saying here the sentences are almost the size of the sentences is almost small is almost always smaller than the size of the tokens. Self-attention can be restricted to considering only neighborhood of size R in the input sequence centered around the respective output position. So this they they say that rather than every part of the token or of the sentence of the sequence, sorry, paying attention to every other part of the sequence, we could basically limit it to only a specific part. So this would kind of be a, a version of masking as well, right? Single convolutional layer with kernel with k less than n does not connect all pairs of input and output positions. Okay, so you, if you have a sentence involving it with a kernel, right, in convolution, kind of multiplying this by this. So every the kernel size is less than the length, right? So within each kernel, right, you're only like this part of the sequence you're going to multiply with the kernel here, but then you're multiplying the kernel with the end part of the sequence much later. So like the, there isn't really a good connection between part of the part of the sequence. So that's kind of what they're re referring to there with the, uh, the connecting the pairs of input and output positions. Dilated convolutions are basically convolutions where uh, rather than the kernel paint 
everything on sequence like that skips position. Kind of have empty normal convolution, dilated convolution. Convolution layers are generally more expensive than recurrent layers. Self-attention could in yield more interpretable models. We inspect attention distributions from our model and discuss examples in the appendix. So the fact that you can look at what parts of the sequence are paying attention to what other parts of the sequence means that you could look at that matrix and say, okay, well, what, what things are related here? And maybe we can have more of an idea of what the black box is doing. Okay. I think the problem with this is that while that is true, uh, or like kind of a smaller transformer, like once you have thousands of these transformers stacked on top of each other and the things that they're paying attention to aren't even, it's like embeddings, right? Different parts of embeddings paying attention to other different parts of embeddings. It's like, what does that even mean anymore, right? So I think that interpretability is still very difficult, especially in these, uh, the way that transformers are used now in these giant models. It's, it's very difficult to even know what is paying attention to what, because you don't really know what each of those things is anyways. So once you go like one layer deep into the black box and everything becomes an embedding, it's very difficult to know what anything means anymore. Okay, so they're basically training on this giant data set here. It's not even giant. This is actually pretty small nowadays. 4.5 million sentence pairs, 37,000 tokens. Uh, the 8 NVIDIA P100, so this is the kind of server rack that we saw. Each training step takes 4 seconds, a total of 10,000 steps. Uh, good old Atom Optimizer. The Atom Optimizer has, uh, different hy has these hyperparameters here. So if you actually uh, PyTorch Atom Optimizer, right? That's what these are. So here, betas equals 0 0.9, 0 0.999, and then epsilon is 1e to the negative 0, 0.8. So these are the default values for the PyTorch Atom Optimizer. And the ones that they used are just slightly different, right? They have 0.9 and then 0.98. So 0.9 and then they made this one a little bit smaller, this beta two. And then the epsilon, they, uh, the default epsilon in PyTorch is one e to the negative eight. And here the epsilon that they use is uh, 10 to the negative nine. So a little bit smaller there. Um, okay, so they, they use a uh, warm up steps. So, Basically when you're training these networks, right, uh, optimizers, and especially because they're doing uh, a layer norm here, right, uh, right here, where was it? No, actually let's do our little trick here, right here, yeah. The uh, layer norm. So these different layer norms and the way that that interacts with the atom optimizer, you basically want to like feed a couple batches through so that your, uh, kind of the, mo right, you, the analogy of the ball rolling through a, down this like kind of like hill as what you're doing with training, right? The, the, ad, the optimizer is determining what direction that ball moves in. So you want the ball to already be kind of moving, right? You want this kind of like momentum concept of the ball before you actually start taking steps. So that's kind of what the warm up steps are doing here is that basically you, you're adding some momentum to that little marble that's rolling through this hilly landscape before you actually start moving the marvel. That was low-key a terrible description. Sorry for that. 
Okay. Three types of regularization. Good old dropout. So we apply dropout to the output of each sublayer before it is added to the sublayer input and normalized. So what does that mean? That means that sometimes here, um, they sometimes they don't. Uh, they they put a dropout here in this add and norm, right? So add and norm it takes takes the residual connection and then the output of the sublayer, which is the output of this multi tension or the output of this feed forward. And sometimes they'll basically zero out that. So in this case, uh, every there's a probability of one zero point one. So every tenth time, basically, they'll they'll zero out that. Uh, this part here, the sublayer X. They also apply dropout to the sums of the embeddings and the positional encodings. So there's also dropout here. So in this little plus here, when the input embedding goes through here, sometimes they add the positional encoding, sometimes they don't. All right, results. So basically they're just training on this English to German translation task and then also English to French translation task. The way these kind of LLM benchmarks are scored with this like blue score. I'm not really like a language guy. I'm more of a computer vision guy. So like, I don't really actually know what these scores mean, but it's, Basically, at the time, it was kind of state-of-the-art. So you see here, transformer 28, 1. So the the other kind of uh, models at this time were, you know, not that much worse. Like, basically around the same thing, 38 or um, 40, 26, 40. Like, so it's not like transformers were like a huge step function in this uh, these language benchmarks. We're kind of largely on par, just barely state of the art. Okay, so it's interesting that the model that they use is actually the average of the last five checkpoints. Okay, so we vary the number of attention heads and attention key and value dimensions. So they did kind of an ablation study here of the using different values, right? So different values of DK and DV and how did that change the score? So there actually isn't much difference here. If you actually look at all these scores here, like all of these are within one point. So even doubling this, the dimensionality of the keys and doubling again, right? Still not really making a difference. Trained a four layer transformer with D equals 1024. Okay, so there's some kind of Wall Street Journal data set here that they're training on. Despite the lack of task-specific tuning, our model performs surprisingly well, yielding better results than all previously reported models. So yeah, I mean, the transformer wasn't like an absolute uh, explosion, right? It wasn't like uh, when AlexNet and the ConfNets 
first started to come into the computer vision scene where suddenly you had like a step function improvement in the benchmarks. The Transformer, when it was released here, was kind of, was doing better than the uh, the other approaches, but it really wasn't like an um, ridiculously amazing, right? It was basically just like, oh, it seems to be a little bit better than what we have right now. So it's interesting that in this paper, it's it's actually qu kind of humble and kind of like, you know, they didn't realize what they just discovered here and that this transformer would become kind of the, the key architecture for the huge models that we have now. So we are excited about the future of attention based model and plan to apply them to other tasks. Cool. This is uh, looking at what parts of the sequence are paying attention to what, right? So you can, it's kind of hard, you're gonna have to rotate your head to see, but you can basically see, okay, this word making here, like what words of the same sequence, right? Because here you have the same sentence, paying attention to yourself, so then which tokens sentence correspond to which so you can see that the word making here is mostly paying attention to the word more difficult which makes sense you're making things more difficult And EOS here is basically just an end of sequence token, and then pad is a padding just to make the dimensionality the same. So, yeah, that's attention is all you need. Uh, this is pretty old paper at this point, 2017. That's over five years ago, six years ago, something like that. So, ancient history when it comes to deep learning, but I think it's important and it was a big paper uh, at the time and it's kind of only grown more and more important. And again, yeah, it's it's kind of cited by a lot of different things now. And this is the, the architecture that's behind all your GPT. Uh, it's behind the vision transformers, which are used in a bunch of different uh, computer vision tasks at this point. Like vision transformers are slowly replacing uh, convolutional uh, feature encoders. So I think it's important. Um, let me know if you liked this stream, if you guys want me to do this. I figured I've been kind of going and reading kind of more historical papers. If you guys prefer the more historical papers to kind of the more up-to-date papers, let me know if you guys would rather just, uh, I read the more recent up-to-date papers. I can also do that more. But yeah, thanks for listening and see everybody 